Our gospel passage today, which Deacon Bud just read, is Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 32. But I'm actually going to expand the scope of my homily to include all of the 13th chapter of St. Mark's gospel, because it all has a common theme. And so if, for example, you were to look at the various section headings for Mark chapter 13 that's in the Bibles in your pew racks, here are the section headings that you would find. The first one, the destruction of the temple foretold. Next, persecutions foretold. Then the desolating sacrilege, the coming of the Son of Man, the lesson of the fig tree, and finally the necessity for watchfulness. So Mark 13 is part of a body of scriptural accounts that present us with truth that can be both troubling and confusing. Troubling because it prophesies terrible events to come that are hard for us to contemplate. Things in the sky, things in the earth, cataclysmic events that are going to overtake creation. And it's confusing because eschatology, which is the theological term for the study of end times prophecy, frequently presents a kind of crazy quilt mixture of events that are presented together but occurring in different times or in different eras and different sequences and in images that are sometimes metaphorical, sometimes very literal. That's why it's always a little dangerous to become overly dogmatic or argumentative in the teaching and exposition of eschatological truth. Regarding the sequence of events surrounding the Great Tribulation and the Lord's Second Coming, for example, there's a broad array of opinion and interpretations within the church, some of which are contradictory and mutually exclusive. So I believe that the scriptures are intentionally vague and veiled and nonspecific on this point so that we don't become too wrapped up in the timing of events to the exclusion of a proper consideration of how end times prophecy should affect the way we live our lives. That's really what's most important here. When you distill it all down, here is what's important to know. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We proclaim some variation of this truth at every Mass, every time we celebrate the Mass, along with the Nicene Creed's profession, He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Now, the Gospel passage before us this morning from Mark 13 is part of a discourse by Jesus to His disciples in direct response to two questions that they had asked. So at the beginning of this chapter, at the beginning of Mark 13, we see Jesus and the disciples leaving the temple. And the disciples are looking around and they're marveling at the incredible magnificence of the building itself, and rightly so. It was a tremendously magnificent building. But Jesus absolutely blows them away by prophesying that this very temple that they are admiring, the very epicenter of Jewish life, the very epicenter of Jewish spirituality, this very building is about to be utterly destroyed. Here's what he says in verse 2. Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You can imagine, you can imagine the impact that that had in the hearts of the disciples when they hear this, but I think they were so stunned that they didn't even respond right away because it's apparently not until they reach the Mount of Olives outside the eastern wall of the cities, the city rather, that they muster the courage to respond to Jesus' provocative prophecy about the destruction of this temple. And the response, as I just said, takes the form of two questions that Peter, James, John, and Andrew ask him privately. Here, the question, here are the questions. When will this be? 
And what will be the sign when these things are all about to be accomplished? So then Jesus' answer to those two questions begins in verse 5 of Mark 13. It goes all the way to the end of the chapter, all the way to verse 37. So as we begin to look at this passage, it's important for us to understand something that the passage represents. Much of Mark 13 and much of other end times prophecies throughout the, the gospel are examples of what scripture scholars call multiple reference. Multiple reference. Multiple reference is present when a single biblical prophecy actually refers to two or more separate occurrences. That's multiple reference. So Jesus' prophecy here is a multiple reference in that it refers to something that had actually already taken place in history, plus it was a prophecy of something that was about to occur historically in the foreseeable future and occur as well in the distant future. So what do I mean? Well, let's, let's look at an example in verse 14. This is part of the, of the overall prophecy of Mark 13. Verse 14, but when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. St. Matthew's version of this same passage says it this way, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Jesus ties his prophecy concerning the desolating sacrilege or the abomination of desolation. He ties it directly to the prophecy of Daniel, which was written 600 years earlier and which we just read from, from Daniel chapter 12. We read verses 1 through 3 of Daniel 12, but if we look just a little bit ahead to verse 11, we read this. And from the time that the continual burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, Daniel's prophecy concerning the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, that is in the holy place, the holy of holies in the temple, was actually fulfilled historically in the year 168 BC. This is the first reference of the multiple references in, in this prophecy. So this is the first reference of Jesus' prophecy that I said had already taken place historically. Now what happened in 168 BC? Well, briefly what happened was that the Greek conqueror by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. And in a move that was intended to both utterly humiliate the Jews as well as to institu institute pagan worship in Judea and specifically in Jerusalem, Antiochus erected a pagan altar to the Greek god Zeus right on top of the altar of sacrifice in the temple. And then he began to sacrifice pigs on that altar to the pagan deity. You can imagine what that did in the hearts and minds of observant Jews. The well do so, so serious was their pushback against this move that the well-documented revolt of the Maccabees ensued in response to that desolating sacrilege. But Jesus, as I said, was also prophesying a second desolating sacrilege that would take place historically approximately 40 years after the Lord spoke these words. That abomination began in 67 AD. When a, this was about 37 years after Jesus' ascension back to heaven. When a large band of the class known uh, among the Jews as the Zealots, Jewish Zealots, mostly non-observant but political Jews who were rabidly in favor of violently overthrowing the Roman occupation of Judea, 
forcibly took control of the entire city of Jerusalem, including the temple, and in the process, they actually murdered a number of their own observant Jewish brethren right in the Holy of Holies, right in the holy place. They then mockingly raised up and anointed an utterly unworthy and ill-prepared man named Phineas ben Samuel to the position of high priest, again, as an act of mockery of their own people's worship. When the Jewish Christians of Jerusalem witnessed this, the Jewish Christians of Jerusalem, they immediately hearkened back to the words of Jesus in Mark 13, 14, which we just read. Let me reread it to you. Jesus said, but when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So when the Jewish Christians of Jerusalem saw what was going on, they saw this des desolating sacrilege, they took Jesus at his word. They fled to the mountains. They fled to the mountainous area surrounding the town of Pella, near the Sea of Galilee. The abomination reached its climax three years later, in 70 AD, when the Roman army, under the general and soon-to-be emperor Titus, laid siege to Jerusalem, utterly destroyed the temple, and erected an idol on the burned-out rubble of the Holy of Holies. The ancient historians Josephus and Eusebius both record that in the carnage that accompanied the Roman sack of Jerusalem in 70 AD, more than a million Jews died and another 100,000 were carried off into slavery. But, but, there is no evidence that a single Christian died in the siege because of the watchfulness and obedience of the church at Jerusalem in taking heed to the Lord's earlier warning and fleeing the city. Now there's a direct parallel between the fall of Jerusalem and the circumstances surrounding the last days, which is the final and yet to be fulfilled reference in this prophecy of Jesus. This yet to be fulfilled prophecy refers among other things to the emergence of the Antichrist. You hear a lot of talk today within the church about the Antichrist because we look at the, the, the situation in the world as it's spiraling down out of control and it makes us all think that this must be setting the stage for the Antichrist and it probably is. So this Antichrist at some point in the future will set himself up in the holy city as the object of worship for the whole world. That's the, that's the end game of this, right? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes this in verses 1 through 4. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to be quickly shaken in mind or excited, either by spirit or by word, or by letter purporting to be, purporting to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, that's, an, that's a synonym for the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This prophecy is repeated in the book of Revelation, specifically in chapter 13 of, Re of Revelation. So what we have here then is the Lord Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and John the Revelator all saying the same thing, all prophesying about the emergence of the Antichrist and of the coming of the Great Tribulation. And by the way, the word that we translate in English as tribulation is a kind of an interesting one in the original Greek. 
It's the Greek word thalipsis, thalipsis, which literally means a crushing or a pressing, as of grapes in a wine press or grist in a mill. And so it has a, a very compelling imagery of this complete crushing, and so figuratively of the unbearable devastation of this time of great tribulation. Jesus prophesies also in the first half of Mark 13, as well as in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21, the signs that will lead up to this time, the great cosmic upheaval that will accompany this. And you know there's something very interesting going on right now that relates to these signs. What I'm talking about is our secular society's growing preoccupation with an appetite for things apocalyptic. Have you noticed, for example, the number of big budget films these days that are dedicated to the subjects of cataclysmic fires and floods and tornadoes and monster storms and earthquakes and volcanoes, plagues, tsunamis and killer asteroids the size of Texas. Have you noticed? There's almost an obsession with this. The Weather Channel even airs a feature titled The Ten Top Ways the World Could End. The Weather Channel. They have trouble getting the weather right, but they're, they're going to tell us. But at the same time, our culture demonstrates a kind of paradoxical, almost schizophrenic mix of anxious frustra frustration about things apocalyptic right alongside their relentless pursuit of pleasure and self-aggrandizement and godlessness. Our ever more godless culture races along contentedly, acting as if judgment will never come. This deceived by the evil one. Deceived, our culture is deceived by the evil one in so many ways. Deception is the enemy's primary tool, isn't it? It has been so since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Did God really say, right? And it is so today. And one of the ways he deceives is by counterfeiting the work of the Holy Spirit, showing signs and wonders that are calculated to deceive, if possible, even true believers, even us. Let's not be deceived. The truth is that the deception of true believers will not be possible as long as we take heed of what Jesus has told us. Verses 22 and 23. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed, I have told you all things beforehand. Now, think back again to what happened with the Christians in Jerusalem when the Roman army invaded and laid siege to the city. They saw that as a fulfillment of what Jesus had already forewarned them. They fled the city and thus they were saved. And so what we have then in Jesus' words in all of Mark 13 is not an admonition to be preoccupied or obsessed with all of the specifics of the signs that are pointing to Jesus' return nor to be obsessed with the timing or the sequence of events surrounding his return. We're not meant to know when he will return. Jesus says that very specifically in today's gospel. Nor is it a warning to be fearful. Rather, it is an exhortation to be vigilant. It is an admonition to remain faithful to the end, to maintain an attitude of watchfulness for his return. And the proper response to that watchful attitude for us should be behavior, should be a lifestyle that is reflected in continual service to God and to others as well. Why? Because if we are the Lord's servants, and we are, and we know that the Lord is returning, and we do, but we don't know when, 
and we don't, doesn't it stand to reason that we would want Jesus to find us serving him and our brothers and sisters when he does return? He makes specific reference to that notion in Matthew 24 when he says this, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed, he says, is that servant whom his master, when he returns, will find so doing. And so in conclusion, the purpose of end times prophecy is not to pique people's curiosity. It's not to provide material for Hollywood or for the supermarket tabloids or to provide Christians with fodder for endless and pointless argumentative speculation. The purpose of end times prophecy is to give us as believers an understanding of unfolding events and to see them in the context of God's plan and purpose, to order both our thinking and the way we live our lives accordingly. What we have today in Jesus' words, again, as I said, is a call to watchfulness, a call to faithfulness to the Lord, a call to discern the signs of the times while shunning false prophets and false Christs, a call to anticipate the Lord's return with faith, with joy, and with the confidence that comes from knowing that we belong to him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.